look at you My whole life falls in line I prayed for you Thank you so much for the grace that you bestowed upon these two to bring them to this moment. We think about how you reserved your first miracle to bring the joy of a young couple being married into completion when you turned water into wine. We know that you delight in the covenant of marriage. And so, Lord, we pray 
that your presence would make this a special moment for Kalani and Desiree and all of us that have gathered to be a part of this ceremony as they enter into covenant as husband and wife. Bless this day, we pray. To your great namesake. Amen. You may have a seat. So I want to share just a couple of hours. <laughs> We're all eager to get to the festivities, but this is a most sacred moment. And I just want to remind you what it is that you are entering into as in the covenant of marriage of husband and wife. Yep. You are entering into a covenant. It's not a contract. We sign contracts all the time. In a contract, it's something you promise to do. You, there are certain terms. Each side of the agreement agrees to do a particular thing, but it's really about doing something. Covenant is very different. Covenants, you don't promise to do something. You promise to become something. It, it is a relationship that you begin that alters your identity. And as we look to the Bible, we find that the covenants that God makes are solemn promises to be in relationship with his people. And so this is not a contract of marriage. It's a covenant of marriage. Because you are promising to become a husband. You are promising to become a wife. And so I want to just remind you, as you've had an opportunity to read that excellent book that you read on marriage, written by me. <laughs> what the purpose of marriage is, what the goal of your marriage is. And we find that in the opening chapters of the Bible. There we read in Genesis chapter 1 that at each step of creation, each day, God looked over what he had made that day and said, it's good. And then as the climax of creation comes on that sixth day with the creation of man, God looks over all of it and he says, it's very good. And in Hebrew, poetry is conveyed not by rhyming sounds, but rather by repetition. So we read, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is very good. And we develop this poetic sense. Mm. And then we find there is still before sin has even come into the story. God looks at man, he's alone, and he says, oh, that's not good. And it's jarring. It's almost like we've been listening to this beautiful music and now this major uh, loud minor chord is sounded. And, it, and it, what, 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 what can be not good in God's good creation? Well, God says it's, it's not good that the man should be alone. And we know the solution to that is he, he makes the woman, but there's these two verses that seem to interrupt the story, and we wonder why. Because God says, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper com comparable to him. And then we know that that's Eve. Then why the story of God bringing all the animals to Adam to see what he would name them? Well, because Adam did not see at that point what God saw, that he was alone. That's all he had ever known. And he was fine with it. He's living in paradise. But he doesn't understand how as the days go on and he's by himself, he's not going to just be alone. He's going to be lonely. And so God brings all the animals to Adam and has him name them. And if we can picture the scene, I think it just really brings it home. So there Adam is and all the animals line up. And he starts to name them. And he realizes each of them has a companion. Uh, the cows and the deer and the birds, they all have a male and a female. And it's a long day of work naming the animals. And now Adam knows that he's alone because he's seen all these creatures with their companions. And so now he's not just alone, he's feeling alone. God didn't create us to be alone. He created us for a relationship with him. And so he gives us a relationship with someone like him, an image bearer of him, so that we can learn more about him. Your marriage is, yes, it's about this covenant between the two of you, but trust me, you're going to learn a lot about God in your marriage as husband and wife. And so God then puts Adam to sleep and takes from his side that which he makes to his, into his bride. And I would just ask you to remember where God took Eve from, Kalani. 
from, God, from Adam's side. Not from his foot to be beneath him, or from his head to be above him, but from his side to be next to him, and close to his heart to be cherished by him, and from under his arm to be protected by him. And then God brought them together in that first garden wedding and performed that ceremony, that first wedding, and said, now the two shall become one. That's the goal of marriage. The purpose of marriage is to solve that problem of loneliness. The goal of marriage, loneliness is solved when we have that companionship where we become one. You don't cease to be what you were as individuals, but now you become something more. You become one. And something mystical is happening here right now, and we see it in every wedding that takes place. Before a wedding, we think of people as individuals. You were Kalani. You were Desiree. And something's going to happen here this afternoon as we leave this place in a little bit where we won't be able to think of Desiree, pause, Kalani. It's going to be Kalani and Desiree from here on out because you will become one. God is here. You are gathering in His name. He is present. He is here making you one. And this begins something new. You don't cease to be individuals, but you become something greater than the sum of your parts. And so in just a moment, you're going to be exchanging vows. And you're going to enter into the covenant of marriage by saying two words with a total of three letters. Before you do, I want to remind you what it is that you're saying, I do too. So, Kalani, let me read from Ephesians where we read, first of all, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. We men would love it if the Bible just said, love your wife. But we don't get off that easy. We are to love our wives as Christ loves the church. And we know how he loved the church. He went all the way. He gave himself for her. You see, God loves this one. And he wants her to experience his love through you. God loves us, but we, He shows us His love through the actions of others. And so God wants to bless her, and so God gave her you. You are to be His love, His care, His protection, His nurture, His provision. You are to be that for her. And you do that by loving her. By letting her know that she's next to Him the most important thing. And that you recognize your responsibility to lead her in the things of God, to provide for her, to make it safe for her. And as you do that, it then frees her to fulfill her part as a wife, which we'll get to in just a moment. A, a wife's primary need is security. Am I right? To know she's safe. And she will know that she's safe when you love her actively. Your words, your actions, in the middle of the day when you're apart to just call and to say, I was thinking about you, I just wanted to let you know that I was thinking about you. Little acts like that. Let her know that you're thinking about her and that you're caring for her and you want her to know that you love her. Desiree, what you're about to say I do too is to be a wife. And it's interesting because Paul's words here, he, 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 we know that the Bible calls us to love one another. Interesting, isn't it, that the Bible never calls a wife to love her husband? Not once. Yes, you're to love him. We're to love all people. But a wife is called in the Bible to respect her husband. And the reason why is because that's what a man needs, respect. And when you show that respect by deference to him and his, his lead in the relationship, it makes him want to become for you the husband you need. As you love her, it frees her to give herself to you. You get blessed when you love her. When you respect him actively with your, with your words and your actions, it frees him to become for you what you need. So when you love, you get blessed. And when you respect, Bible term submission, when you defer to him that way, it, you're the one that gets blessed by that. Heaven, marriage can be really a little picture of heaven. You are a picture of Christ, and you are a picture of the church. And as you live out this relationship 
as a, as a husband according to God's word, a wife according to God's word, you become a blessing to everyone that sees your marriage. Because now they understand, oh, this is, what, this is what it's supposed to be like. So may you not only be blessed in your union as husband and wife, but may you become a blessing to others as they watch your union. Would you turn and face each other? Do you, Kalani, take Desiree to be your lawfully wedded wife, to love her as Christ loves the church and has given himself for her, to honor and cherish her as you do your own self, in health and in sickness, in prosperity, in adversity, and leaving all others to keep yourself only for her so long as you both shall live? I do. And do you, Desiree, in like manner, solemnly agree to receive Kalani as your lawfully wedded husband, to love and respect him, to live with him in all faithfulness and tenderness, to esteem him as God's appointed head in your home, in health and in sickness, in prosperity and in adversity, and leaving all others to keep yourself only for him so long as you both shall live? I do. Good. Dr. Kalani, do you have a symbol of your commitment to Desiree? Yes, I do. The rings are a beautiful symbol of the covenant of marriage. Uh, they are made of precious metal that has been refined in the fire. Just as you as a couple human beings are going to experience challenges to your relationship, disagreements, hurts, all of those as you submit those things to the Lord become the means by which you become purified and God can do that work inside you to make you even more precious, not only to each other but to Him. It's round, symbolizing the promise that you're making today isn't based just on your strength that can begin and end but the circle has no beginning has no end it's a reminder that really what you're pledging to each other is to love with the love of God when you come to the end of yourself to say Lord give me what I need now to be for my mate what, what's needed so would you place that on her finger And we're going to stop for just a moment. And would you go ahead and here, I'll take these. Would you just take a moment just in silence to look at her hand and ask the Lord to place that image into your memory and repeat after me with this ring. With this ring, through the power of God's Spirit, through the power of God's Spirit, I vow to love you. I vow to love you. To walk in faithfulness with you. To walk in faithfulness with you. And to be gracious unto you. And to be gracious unto you. Would you place that on his finger? And just take a moment to. <laughs> See that image put in it in your memory. And repeat after me. With this ring. With this ring. Through the power of God's Spirit. Through the power of God's Spirit. I vow to love you. I vow to love you. To walk in faithfulness with you. To walk in faithfulness with you. And to be gracious unto you. And to be gracious unto you. Kalani and Desiree are now going to celebrate communion. They desire that everyone here understand that their covenant isn't just a covenant of two, but a covenant of three. As the Bible says that one walks alone, he may stumble, but if two walk together, his friend can lift him up, but a threefold cord is not quickly broken. They have the unseen presence of a third member in their union, the presence of Jesus Christ. So we're going to celebrate communion. Gorgeous flowers, by the way. <laughs> so, um, I want to just, I, 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 I just want to share with you verbally what I shared in the email. 
All my words for sure. Communion, communion remembers the work of Christ that we would be forgiven. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. He wants us to remember that he forgives us. Forgiveness is hard. Sometimes it's really hard because we've been hurt. An offense is as strong as the as the one to whom it is committed. The greater the, the greater the purity, the more the hurt. No one hurt more than God. Because he's absolutely holy. Yet he forgives. And that's what communion's So don't look at forgiveness as, as I shared in the email, as this thing that you pass out one at a time, you know. Decide now that you're going to forgive. Think about, think about how much easier it is to go to somebody that we know is ready to forgive us when we mess up. <laughs> If we know, that's why we know. If I mess up, I can go to God right now and because I know he's waiting to forgive me. You're going to mess up, guys. You're going to mess up. But if you have that knowledge that, oh my goodness, no matter what happens, they're going to forgive me. Why? Because we were to become one. And then you use, I'm not saying you don't talk about what happened. You, you, you need to talk through those things and say, here's what you said or here's how you said it. It wouldn't be what was anymore. It's, it's the tone you used. You know, whatever it is. That hurt me. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. And then I, I, I will, by God's grace, hope to never do that again. But I, if I do, would you immediately tell me? Because don't we do that too? We get hurt and then we don't really say anything. We kind of go away and let it fester. And then we come back and say, it's three days and we're acting all pissy. Excuse me. <laughs> Isn't it true? I am. I'll but if we can say right away, well, no, hold on, something happened here. This is where we need to get closer. Okay, listen, you said this or you did this. So what I'm asking is that when you take communion, knowing how ready God is to forgive, you would say, Lord, by your grace, enable me to stand, to decide today. The future is forgiven. The whole future is forgiven. I know, I know my mate is going to mess up. I forgive them now. I forgive them now. And then that way, when stuff happens, you can come together so much more quickly. Instead of going through all that hours and sometimes days of pain, where you know we're not right with each other, it needs to get fixed. Does that make sense? Yes. Take that, Dr. Kwani, break it in half. Give some to your bride. Father, I pray that you would bless these two with the fullness of your grace and your forgiveness. Let mercy reign in this marriage, I pray. Go ahead and take care. Seeing that the two of you have exchanged vows and received rings and token of your commitment to one another, I now declare that you are husband and wife according to the ordinance of God and the laws of the state of Hawaii. You may kiss your husband. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you so much. How good you are. That in your providence and mercy, you brought these two together to meet, to begin build relationship, to get to know each other, and then bring them to the glory of this day. Oh, Lord, let your favor rest upon them. Let your grace be abundant unto them. May their joy be complete in you, we pray. Yes, God. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Thank you. <laughs> it's my privilege to present to you at this time, Dr. Kalani and Desiree Jose. Oh, I fall. 